Hi, and welcome to another chapter of Neil Graffy's Historic Santa Barbara. You know, one of Santa Barbara's many charms is her street names. When they named them back in 1851, they just didn't go A to Z, presidents, or names of trees like so many other cities did and have done. Instead, they reflected back on the past, the early families, the governors, the Chumash, colorful characters, sarcasm, and even humor. One of my favorite stories, and one which is the basis for three of our street names, is that of El Canon Perdido, or the Lost Canon, which as it turns out, wasn't so much lost as it was stolen. Our story of El Canon Perdido begins with the wreck of the Brig Elizabeth in February of 1848. She'd been transporting goods between Monterey, Santa Barbara, and San Pedro. She left here on the evening of February 11th, and for whatever reason, failed to clear the point and went aground. Among the items salvaged from the ship was a cannon, which ended up in the hands of Captain Francis J. Lippett, the military commander of Santa Barbara. The cannon was taken up to Lippett's headquarters, the Thompson Adobe, at the corner of State and De La Guerra Streets. In early April of 1848, the cannon was moved down to the beach here at the foot of present-day Chapala Street to await transport to the capital at Monterey. It never got there. Now let's remember, the war with Mexico had ended a little over a year ago, California was not yet a state and was under military rule. And there were some who still believed the Americans could be overthrown. Witnesses had already overheard members of the powerful De La Guerra family and several other Barbaranials discussing how easy it could be to overtake the American barracks here at Santa Barbara. And now, sitting on the beach was an 800-pound cannon. 43-year-old Jose Antonio De La Guerra, whose father had been commandant of the Santa Barbara Presidio, certainly knew a golden opportunity when he saw one. Around 10 or 11 o'clock on the night of April 5, 1848, De La Guerra hooked up with Jose Lugo and borrowed a pair of oxen from Bernardo Ruiz, a rather feisty local Santa Barbara citizen. From there, they headed over to the Garcia Adobe and picked up the Garcia brothers, both named Jose, by the way. Next, they stopped off at the Coda Adobe where they were supposed to get Valentin Coda, but he was sick, so his son Pacifico joined them instead. From there, they headed down to the beach. Excuse me. Hi there. Just following your tracks up. Oh yes, we're going to cover those up. I've sent the Garcia brothers to go get my horses so we can trample up the sand. Well, that ought to do the trick. This was a pretty easy trail to follow. Yeah. So, what are you doing? Well, the plan was to drag this old cannon up to El Cerrito de los Voluntarios, but it's just way too heavy. Uh -huh, the Hill of the Volunteers. You know, that's where the Marmonte, the shirt, that's where the Radisson is. Yeah. The what? Well, let's see. Never mind. You started here about Chapala Street, past Stern's Wharf, Mission Creek. You know, you've only gone a third of a mile. You've got a whole other mile to go to get over here to the hill. So, what's with this? Well, the oxen have given out. Bernada's going to kill me when she sees them. So, now the plan is, we're going to bury the cannon and leave it here for a while. Okay. I'm hoping that Captain Lippett will have some kind of fit when he finds out that it's gone. You know, I can assure you he will. Well, then that alone will make it worth the effort. Well, it has been a true pleasure to meet you, Senor de la Guerra. Good luck. Well, thank you, Senor. What's your name? I didn't even know I could speak English. Now, Captain Lippett did indeed have some kind of a fit. In his panic, he ignored the usual chain of command, and he sent a rider straight to Monterey to warn the military governor, Colonel Richard B. Mason, of the imminent insurrection and requested immediate military backup. But Mason was of a cooler head, and he suggested we give it time for the cannon to reappear. However, when that didn't happen, he levied a tax of $500. But actually, they didn't call it a tax. They called it a contribution of $500 as compensation for the loss of the cannon. Now, Mason did, however, promise to return the $500 if and when the town built a jail. Now, so were the Barbaranos bitter about this $500 contribution? 
people the answer has been greeting us for over 150 years. Let's go to the map room and check this one out. This map from 1887 shows us what they intended when they named the streets. Now, the first street you came across coming into Santa Barbara was Quinientos, Spanish for the 500. And it follows the track that where they stole the cannon, starting here at Chapala, going along the beachfront. But I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Neil, this is not Quiniento Street. But up until the late 1800s, it was Quiniento Street. Then they started calling it the Boulevard or West Boulevard. And eventually in 1919, it became Cabrillo Boulevard. But that's another story. Now the second street you come across is Mason Street, named for the governor who gave us the $500 fine. Now you might expect the next street up would be named Cannon Perdido though, to you know, follow the story along. But look where they put Cannon Perdido Street. They put it way up here between the De La Guerra and the Creole families, the two families that hatched the plot to steal the cannon. But Santa Barbans weren't content to just leave the story on our city streets. They dragged it all the way to City Hall. The original seal for the city of Santa Barbara shows their amusement with this story. It has a cannon on the beach with the mountains in the background and the inscription, Valle Quinientos Pesos, which depending on your interpretation is value $500 or goodbye $500. So, whatever happened to the cannon? Well, a winter storm in 1858 uncovered it and was hauled with great ceremony up to the De La Guerra house and put on display. However, several years later, it was sold for scrap to a San Francisco foundry, and thus the cannon came to a rather inglorious end. Or did it? Upon viewing the cannon, Jose Garcia, one of the five who had stolen it that April night, recalled that this one seemed much smaller than the one they had dragged down the beach 10 years before. So maybe, just maybe, it's still lost and waiting to be discovered. As people fly along the streets of Santa Barbara, they take for granted the scenes they pass by every day, never realizing the history under their noses. To anyone driving by, this looks like just a big old rock, maybe part of the Mission Creek Bridge behind me. But how this boulder got here is a story that actually begins halfway around the world from here. The Azores Islands are in the Atlantic Ocean, about 900 miles off the coast of Portugal and some 4,700 miles from Santa Barbara. It was here that George Oliver was appointed as the United States Vice Council. It was also here that he met, fell in love with, and married his boss's daughter, Frances Dabney. Oliver retired in 1880, and being in somewhat poor health, decided to find a climate more suitable for his convalescence. He found it an ocean and a continent away in Santa Barbara, then a community of 3,400. He and his wife purchased nine acres at the entrance to Mission Canyon, and their home soon became a favorite stopping place for guests and even for tourists who would write of their visit there. This is where we spent our Sunday afternoon in the Mission Canyon. Tea was served by Mrs. Oliver's maid from the Azores, and we marveled at the exotic plants in her garden. This one blooms only once in 100 years. George Oliver died in 1904, and a few years after his death, his widow had these boulders moved out of the creek bed and up here to the corner of Mountain Drive in the entrance to Mission Canyon. Now the biggest one she had hollowed out, and this was a horse trough. And over here was a smaller one. This had a spigot for two-legged critters to drink from, and the overflow filled this bowl for the little furry woodland creatures and birds to drink from. She also put this plaque on it, in memory of George Stewart Johann Oliver, who loved this canyon, 1910. Francis Dabney Oliver passed away in 1926 at the ripe old age of 92. Following her death, a group of friends got together and purchased her property for $27,000 with the intent of donating it to the county as a park. At first it seemed to take the name Oliver Park, but it eventually ended up with the name the Olivers gave it back in 1882, Rocky Nook. <laughs>